One of my first jobs outside of high school was working for Comcast Cable in Nashville, Tennessee. It used to be Viacom and, and it went through several name changes. Uh, but I was there for about three years, right out of high school. I started out as an installer and then I worked my way up to a technician and I was trying to work my way up through the ladder, uh, pardon the pun, uh, until I had an accident and fell from a pole and injured myself. And so I decided, well, I, I might not want to do this the rest of my life. But I remember probably the second year that I was there, and the supervisors did this annually, they would give us an evaluation. And the evaluation was on the basis of our record uh, as far as once we did an install or a repair, w were there follow-up calls because something wasn't cared for? Uh, another had to do with uh, quality control folks that would come behind us and check our work sporadically. But I remember also that one of the categories was does the employee demonstrate good judgment? And when I was asked this by my second supervisor, uh, the first one that I had had transferred to another hub, and so I was uh, a science supervisor. But the second supervisor that I had asked me this, and then I, I you know, I thought, I said, yeah, I'm, I have good judgment, you know. And then he cited a few of my gaffes that I hadn't considered. And I thought, well, I would have to amend my statement. I probably don't have the best judgment. And so one of the things that uh, I've never forgotten about that was all that judgment entails, having good judgment. And not judgment in the sense that I look at another person and I go, well, they're bad, they're wrong, and stuff like that. I think, sadly, one of the most unfortunate realities that a lot of people are living with today is the, the shaming that goes along. Some people will shame you if you don't wear a mask, and some people will shame you if you wear a mask. Some people will shame you if you don't maintain six feet and some people will shame you if you do. One of the worst things to come out of this pandemic, I think, has been a culture of shaming one another. But since that's not necessarily the point to the devotional, I won't dwell on it too long. But when I mention good judgment, I mean uh, making good choices, making good calls, almost like how a referee is in a very important game and if they make the right or the wrong call it could really affect the outcome. However for most sports referees are able to go back and to do a review or an instant replay and slow down frame by frame the play that they made a ruling on to see if they were in fact correct in their ruling or if they made a mistake. One of the things that you and I can agree to is that humans simply make mistakes. Now, not all mistakes are weighed in the balance as equal to others. For example, we can make an error in judgment and we pick the wrong size clothing for someone for a present or the wrong pattern that they wouldn't like or the wrong color. That's not that big of a mistake, nor is it a huge failing of judgment. But now, there are other times when we can make a poor judgment to the effect of someone else's life. One of the things that has been circulating in the news lately that's deeply disturbing has been the February murder of Ahmad Aubrey in Georgia. And more so than that is the fact that it didn't seem that until the footage was made public uh, that there was a public outcry for justice. And unfortunately, uh, even since then, people have somehow found a way to validate or vindicate the two gentlemen who chased him down and ultimately engaged him, resulting in a death. And uh, I saw someone who shared an article today that said that he was thought to have been burglarizing the community and that on the same day that he was shot, there's footage of him at a construction site. And so this one 
website, which I'd never heard of before, wasn't a news agency, but was sort of a, I don't know what you would call it, maybe fake news. But I did find a legitimate source that said that, you know, yes, he was on the property. He was there, according to security footage, that had already been reviewed by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation less than three minutes, and that his presence there did not warrant any felony charges. If anything, he might have been cited for misdemeanor trespass. But he didn't disturb anything. He didn't steal anything. And so on the day that he was murdered, that he was gunned down by one retired police officer who really should have known better with his son, uh, imagine the scenario that you're running for a jog and as you're jogging, you happen to see a construction site, and so you just want to go and look at it. And you go and you look at it. I've done this. I don't know if you have, but there have been times when I go on construction sites in residential places, and I just look around and go, oh, this will turn out to be a nice place. And then you go on about your business. And so he goes on jogging and is chased down by a man who's a retired police officer and should have known better, who brought his son with him, both of them armed, one with a shotgun. And they had attempted to cut him off several times according to certain reports, and so he just kept running around until they sped far enough ahead of him to cut him off and to confront him. Now imagine you're jogging and you've got this truck that has tried to interrupt your jog a few times and you're thinking, what are these guys doing? And then they go far enough ahead of you and as you're jogging, you see that each man has a firearm in his hand. What do you think you're going to do? Don't you think you'd want to think, oh gosh, these guys mean me harm. And he doesn't know that one's a retired officer, nor does he know that maybe they're pursuing him because they think he burglarized the construction site. And so in that whole scenario, you have two guys, especially one being a former officer who should have known better. And because of that, he exercised poor judgment, and that poor judgment cost a man unjustly his life. And so when you think of judgments on certain scales, this was a very poor judgment where a man's life was lost unnecessarily. But when you go to another judgment where you want to pick out a, a flannel shirt or, or, or a dress for someone that you love, and if you choose the incorrect pattern or the wrong color, well, that's not that big of a deal. So there are different levels of judgment calls that we make and some of us are in places of responsibility to make huge judgment calls that affect not just ourselves, but the well-being of others. And so the psalmist says in Psalm 119, verse 66, teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commands. I think this is something that we as Christians should strive for and that is to make good judgment calls. And the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the Philippians, in Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, he essentially prays and wishes for them the same thing. He says to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 9, And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment. Discernment is the ability to see a scenario or to see a probable uh, 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 scenario or outcome and sift through all the factors that have to be considered and make a good call. And Paul goes on in verse 10 to say that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So you, you talk about good judgment. And you talk about the various types of decisions that certain people have to be made, that have to make. Have you ever found yourself saying, I'm sure glad I'm not in their position? I feel that way about a lot of things. I'm glad I'm not in the position of our president or our governor or Dr. Fauci or anybody to have to make the kind of calls that they have chosen to make. Some of them that have received backlash duly and unduly, some of them that have been overturned by judges. And so I, I bring all these things 
just to communicate to you some of the factors our elders here are considering. It's not easy to try and make a call as, as easy as it may seem to everyone of, well, let's just have church again. Let's just open the doors and everybody come. Because you see, here's a rea- here are several realities. First of all, a date was given by our governor here of Kentucky of when churches could reopen, houses of worship could reopen. But then he provided guidelines that we should follow. Of course, they were more orders than they were guidelines at the point. Then a federal judge overturned them because they encroached upon religious liberty. So you have a check and balance of public health and the civil rights of citizens. And just because we can assemble, does it mean that we should? Well, and then you have the consideration of, you know, here's a reality. Not everyone would make the same decision that I would make with the information that we have available. And some of us may have more of that information available to us at our fingertips than what other people have. So we can make better informed decisions than others. And so our elders are trying to weigh not only what the CDC guidelines are, but what the state guidelines are. Also, above all that is our devotion and obedience to God. And so we're trying to say, how would God have us handle this particular reality that we find ourselves in? And so yesterday and today, I've spoken with several of our elders and between the seven of them, uh, there's a lot of information and some of it's coming more rapidly than what we can actually have time to, to, to digest. And so some are thinking one way, some are thinking another way. So we're trying to bring all these factors into consideration to make a good judgment. The judgment of when should we open the doors? And when we do open the doors to have the assembly once again that I am looking forward to, and I know many of you are too, what precautions, if any, should we have to take? Not for anything I would hope because of government saying so, but out of a sincere concern for our fellow brothers and sisters. And then if we do open the doors and put in these precautions, are people going to want to follow them? And what about the people who have higher risk factors? We should discourage them from coming. And so you have all these different factors that have to be considered so that a good judgment can be made. And here's the reality that everyone has accepted. And that reality is this, no matter what decision is made, not everyone's going to be happy with it. So here's what I want to challenge you, the Glendale Road Church to do. I want to challenge you, if you haven't already, begin today and start praying for our elders that they can exercise discernment so that they can make a good judgment because that's sincerely what they're seeking to do. And because there is an overflow of information more than any one person can really handle, those are some of the things that they're battling with presently. It's my hope that we can be together once again sooner rather than later, but not at the peril of any one person. And so pray for them, pray for the church, Uh, We're doing everything we can to bring you devotional material throughout the week to help encourage you and to lift you up. And so we're doing the best we can with the circumstances we have, but yet there are choices that have to be made. And we want to make good choices, responsible choices, and godly choices. So we ask for your prayers for our elders, elders, as they consider all these factors.